So again, as, as people uh, join, would love to just kind of get to know one another, uh, you know, do some fun facts. So uh, good afternoon. Um, so first and foremost, your health is our top priority. And I just think that, you know, this little one bedroom apartment uh, is becoming smaller by the day. So it's incredibly important to have community. Um, for those I haven't met yet, uh, Greg Geibel, uh, and I got an amazing job here uh, at Zendesk, uh, you know, building community. Um, you know, and what's exciting about today is you might meet a friend from San Francisco. You know, you, you might meet a friend from New York or even Texas. So uh, I'm incredibly excited about the opportunity that going virtual or going online has for us. So if we can move to the next slide, you know, again, it, it, it excites me that, you know, people are starting to, you know, really embrace our goals, right? Just to learn something, make a new friend, and ultimately have a bit of fun. Uh, those goals aren't changing. And uh, it, it, it's fascinating. I, I talk about them as community goals, but, you know, they're also daily goals. Uh, that, I, that I try. Um, and so what's, what's fascinating, again, is to think about how we can facilitate those goals over the internet. So if we go to, uh, if we go to our next slide, sweet, uh, we're adding polls. Uh, so if we go to our next slide, right, I, I'm sure many of you have been, you know, uh, done a you know, a uh, Zoom happy hour as an example, but just some, some, some best practices. You know, during the presentation, we're gonna uh, mute the videos, uh, excuse me, we're gonna, uh, we'll hide the videos. Uh, the microphones will be muted during the presentation. Uh, we suggest them being on during the uh, breakouts. And then, you know, if, if you can send uh, any chatter that you have along, um, you know, uh, Q and A's. And then ultimately, I'd one of my favorite parts is, you know, aside from the learning is, you know, the breakout sessions because it's the opportunity uh, that you'll have to, to meet a new friend. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, you know, you'll see that, you know, again, a little bit about our history, um, you know, started in San Francisco and had a little bit of success in San Francisco. Um, you know, the, ultimately the success is, is by, um, you know, amazing, uh, amazing customers and, and more so amazing speakers. And, um, you know, I, I might have snuck one uh, by my boss, Pedro, uh, you know, in this slide where, you know, your logo here, um, you know, so if it is something you feel compelled to tell your story, uh, by all means, uh, would, would love to do that. So if we go then go to the next slide, we ended up, you know, taking the show on the road uh, to, to New York. Um, and then if we go to the, to, to the next slide, uh, again, for those who aren't familiar with Zendesk, you know, three founders, um, and they're ultimately building the next generation of service-first uh, platform, uh, excuse me, CRM. We have uh, over 145,000 customers, and um, with that, uh, you know, this, this can't happen without uh, customers and without um, moderators. So I guess with that, we'll turn it over to Kate and... Uh, I'm excited to uh, meet our panelists today. Wonderful. Thanks, Greg. Hello, everybody. It is great to meet you virtually. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Just making sure. Awesome. Yep. Thanks, Pedro. Um, my name is Kate Garcia. I have been at Zendesk for just a little over eight and a half years now. Um, so as I like to say, kind of a, a lifer. Around these, around these parts. Um, the, the relevant fact around being here as long as I have is my first three years at Zendesk were focused on, at the time, what we called our strategic customer organization, our strategic accounts. And those were primarily made up of startups, just like you guys, as well as our, our small handful of enterprise customers at the time. And it was probably my fondest memory of being at Zendesk was working with such amazing companies that were so early in their, their time as a business and watching them over the past eight years grow up as Zendesk grew up right alongside them. So, you know, you guys are the companies that built Zendesk, continue to be a core focus for our business. Um, and 
consequently are also the most interesting businesses that we work with, to be frank. So I love being a part of this and I appreciate being asked to moderate this panel of really amazing customers that we have today. Um, just a quick sort of setup for what we're going to talk about. We really wanted to um, put together some questions that were relevant to the times that we're in today, right, which are obviously very unique and things that, that none of us have experienced before. It'll be very conversational um, between the three members of our panel. And we really, we want you to walk out of here, you know, with something you can take back and use today, right? Some good tips and good advice. So um, we're going to go through just a couple of questions and, and open up the discussion. But before we do that, um, if we can head to the next slide, Sammy, we're going to introduce our panelists. Um, so we can start with you, Jen, but if each of you could just share with the group kind of who you are, your role, and also how your business uses Zendesk. Sure. Hey, everyone. Jen Burton. Um, I head up the support organization at Digit, and we are a startup uh, whose main goal in life is to uh, make financial health effortless for everyone. Um, so we, we are busy, uh, busy working on that. Um, we're Zendesk users. I've personally uh, been using Zendesk for about 10 years. Um, and at Digit, uh, we use it mostly in email. We do use talk um, where, where our customers can leave us voicemail and then we return. We're not, we don't have live phones turned on quite yet. Uh, so the bulk of our Zendesk use is, is email. And then obviously Explore as well. We use Explore a lot. Great, thank you. And Brandon. Hi, I'm Brandon Ray. Um, I'm the head of about half of community at Fandom, leading up our verticals for uh, TV, movies, and uh, anime communities. Um, also head of customer support. So we use Zendesk primarily over email as well, uh, as well as the, the help desk functionality. And I've been at Fandom for about 10 years and nine of those have been using Zendesk. Awesome. Justine. Yeah, hi, I'm Justine Madison. I head up service and support at Lever. Um, Lever is a talent relationship management platform. So kind of taking over the ATS space and turning it more into an overall talent relationship manager where you go from candidate through the employee experience. Um, I've been at Lever for almost four years. When I got to Lever, I came back to Zendesk. I had used it almost 10 years ago, uh, moved away from it at my last company, came back to Zendesk when I came on at Lever. Um, and we use all of it. We use talk and chat and the help center guide and explore. Um, and we're deeply integrated it in our support processes. Love it. It's, it's so great to have the three of you here and also um, happen to be three people who are extreme Zendesk veterans like myself, right? So it's, it's, I'm, I'd love to hear as you guys talk through some of these questions, you know, how you, what you've seen as some of the growth that's happened as you've used Zendesk and as your companies have grown and our product has obviously grown significantly and, you know, with the omni-channel approach and everything. So would love to hear kind of some of your thoughts on that as we go through. Um, but to kick it off, if we want to go to the next slide, please, Sammy. Um, so I would love to start, if you don't mind, Jen, if I, I tap you for this first one, but, you know, as I talked about at the beginning, we really wanna focus on some of the unique things that we're experiencing today in light of, of this environment that we're in. And I know for a lot of us, um, working from home is different, right? I think that startups may have more remote workforces on and off, but I do know that a big piece of that is the camaraderie and working with your team and collaborating. Um, it can be isolating. It can be hard to share experiences, to get feedback, you know, to collaborate. So how have you worked specifically in this time to keep your teams engaged, right? Sure. To keep them motivated and inspired. Totally. I mean, there's no doubt that our world changed, you know, March 1st. Uh, mm -hmm. Digit went mandatory work from home on March 3rd. Um, we, our, our, our support team and actually the bulk of, of Digit, the company, are all working out of our office in the financial district in San Francisco. So in a split second, we were packing up our bags and heading home. Um, and, you know, so obviously having this go on in 2020 is a way different world. We've got Zoom, we've got Slack, you know, we are all able to stay connected um, in ways that five, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to do so. Um, so 
we're, we're in this world where there's this pandemic and it's stressful. Yeah. Um, some of us live alone. Others live with, I've got someone who's got 12 roommates, I think, lives in a big uh, uh, household. Um, others who have kids, um, you know, and, and everyone's learning how to navigate this new world. Uh, and so one of the ways that's been really, things that's been really important to me that we're doing at Digit is that we are really staying connected. Um, and that means more than um, having our weekly meetings. Um, that means giving space in weekly meetings to talk about what's on our minds, mm -hmm. um, to talk about the ex what we're experiencing in this world today. Um, you know, I think it's very easy to feel human when you're sitting next to someone in an office, you can see the look on their face, you can hear them deep sigh. Um, we can't do that sitting remotely. So uh, it is this um, experience of, you know, hey, can we hop on a Zoom call for three minutes if you're, you know, trying to move through a question in Slack. Um, it is, it is, I think for me, it's absolutely imperative that myself, the support team at Digit, and the rest of the company, and this comes down from our CEO, this is not something I'm doing, um, but that we get to remain human overall. Uh, this is an incredibly human time, so much is out of our control. Um, so take time off. We did uh, a couple weeks ago, Digit gave us an extra day off. It was just, we called it Digit Day Off. Um, everyone got to have a day off in the middle of the week and you know, not worry about work for a day. And I think um, that kind of stuff, um, prioritizing humanity um, is, is I think really key, not only every day, but especially now, um, in the world of COVID. Yeah, I, I could not agree more, Jen. I think that that's the, the theme of the embracing the humanity piece. It's a lot easier to separate that when you are remote, like you said, yeah. and you're not, you know, sitting next to someone, um, you know, Brandon or Jen, you know, any thoughts from you guys on this? And maybe we can start with Brandon in terms of, is there anything that's kind of surprised you with, with seeing how your team is responding to this? Anybody that, you know, has, you know, stepped up to the plate that may have been quiet in the past, anything unique in terms of how the motivation is working on your team? I think what was unique for my team is that of the several dozen people that I have in my org, I was the only one who was actually in an office. Everybody was remote. It was a fully distributed team. So I'm the only one who's actually had to deal with you know, not being in an office anymore. I think everybody kind of feels a little bit of a sense of I'm trapped in my apartment or in my house. But for the remote employees, it's almost sort of on the flip side where it's almost like imagine you were trapped in your office and you couldn't like ever leave that. So they're starting to ask questions and not starting to. They have asked questions about, you know, all of these great new initiatives to keep people engaged when they're working remotely, that's fun. Where was that before COVID? Right. So we're now, I think, kind of changing the culture of fandom in general and having more recognition of the fact that we do have a very distributed workforce mm -hmm. and the things like happy hours or trivia nights or whatever they may be are now just becoming a standard part of what we do at fandom. Like if this was to magically end tomorrow, we would still do something next week. I, that is something I, that I love that point. We hear it all the time with our remote. We're obviously a very dispersed global organization at Zendesk. So I think that's a challenge that a lot of companies that are global face ahead of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, is that a blessing that comes out of all of this that we've learned to sort of adjust how we connect with our peers, both remotely and in the office. Jen, any thoughts from you on that? Justine. Or Justine, excuse me, sorry, Justine. That's I'm okay. looking at Justine and I'm saying Jen, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, I, gosh, I could echo so much of, of what Jen said going in. Um, I think that one thing that we've definitely learned in terms of, of staying motivated and staying engaged is we really can't ignore the elephant in the room. Um, it, you do need to make time to talk about where we're at right now and what people are dealing with. Um, as much as we all have goals and we all have things that we're trying to achieve as a business, without the people who are driving that, we, we're dead in the water. Um, so really taking the time to do what happens organically when you're sitting next to somebody or walking past them in the halls and really making time to go, where are you at? How are you feeling? And when somebody's having a day, like let them off the hook that day. Um, I think yeah. that's one thing that we're really seeing come in handy. Some days you just like it, last week, we 
I don't, I don't know if it was the extension of the shelter in place or, I mean, there's so many things that can contribute to this, but I had a week where almost every meeting I had there, it was feelings. It was like people were stressed, things were hard. Um, you got to let people off the hook that day. You have to yeah. keep them engaged by letting them know that it genuinely matters um, how your team is feeling. Um, and I think that that's, that's really been key for us. And then I think also to kind of echo what Brandon was saying a little bit, um, we have not been a remote team. We've always been a very close team. And so in going remote, one of the things that we adopted was we created a virtual office space. So if you're not <clears throat> doing something else, you're in the virtual office space. Um, and it's allowed us to actually develop a level of communication that we didn't have in the office. Um, and it's kind of created this space where people are connecting in a way that they didn't actually have when we were all on the same floor, but we weren't in constant communication. So I think there's, we're learning a lot and getting better at what remote work looks like. And the people who are remote now feel more part of the team than they ever did when it was all of us in a building and then just a few people outside. So. Um, I think there's definitely been some learnings, but I think at the, at the core of everything, it's the engagement is about being able to care genuinely about the people. Yeah, I love that. I, I completely agree. And I think um, some good, good nuggets and takeaways there from the three of you, from me even, right? We have a lot of remote salespeople and I, I hear regularly from them that it's, it's hard to be remote when everyone's in an office and the team that I run is, a, is a, an inside sales organization. And we're tight knit. So it does, it, it really opens your eyes to what it feels like to be someone who's remote in a company that has a lot of people in office, right? With a strong headquarters culture. So um, I think that that is such a valuable uh, takeaway on this. Um, any other thoughts on this before I head to the next question, panelists? Okay, great. Sammy, if you don't mind moving over this. So I'm going to let um, Justine take this one. Um, so this kind of piggybacks a little bit on the motivating and the staying connected, but I think even more so when you're thinking about your customer facing teams, why do you feel like in today's environment, it's even more important to make sure that, you know, your teams internally are staying closely connected um, in supporting your customers? Gosh, we, we only have an hour, right? Um, right. I think, <laughs> um, this one is just, I think it's, it's always really close to my heart, always. Um, I think that it's very easy. You start as a startup and you have like a small group of people doing everything and everybody's mm -hmm. fingers in every pie and everybody has empathy for what everybody else is working on because they're doing it too. And I know that when Lever started, our CEO, Sarah Nam, was answering technical support questions and doing user research and writing code. Um, and then the company starts to grow up and it's really easy to start developing silos and mm -hmm. you kind of start seeing those teams, even though they're all customer facing, um, have a very different slice of the customer journey in front of them. And so you kind of start to write the story in your own head about what other teams are capable of. So at Lever, one of our core values is cross-functional empathy. Um, and it's really about understanding what the other teams are responsible for, what their goals are, what drives them. Um, salespeople and support people are motivated in very different ways traditionally. Um, so when we're all in the office together, we have that ability to like where the magic happens. We have lunch together. You're talking to other people. So you kind of have that going for you. Here we are. Now we're all remote, right? And Lever is in our sixth week. Um, and when we were talking about this the other day, I told Kate, this was really timely for me. There's a member of our sales team who I have a ton of respect for. I've worked with him for almost four years now really great guy and normally a high level of cross-functional empathy. Um, but with everything that's going on with COVID, things have kind of changed in the way that we're doing things. And we know that support knows what we have changed on the support side and success knows what our customer success managers have had to change and sales knows what they've had to change. But I don't know that we have done a really great job of communicating that across the teams. Um, and that was really evidenced one day last week. I got pulled in on a customer escalation, like you sometimes do. Um, and the salesperson had made the statement to the customer that the level of service they were receiving was unacceptable. And I looked at it. And at first, of course, I kind of got in my feels a little bit about it and was like, don't you dare. Um, but then actually, when I took a step back and I looked at it, I went back and had a conversation with him. And at the root of it was, it was a level of service that they had not previously seen from the support team. 
we've had to kind of pivot and start prioritizing things in a way that we've always been set up for. Like we have very specific tiered service offerings and what comes with that. But up until now, we've kind of had the luxury of not really holding everybody to those. And we've been mm -hmm. able to deliver a level of service even to people on the lower offerings that is outside of that. Um, and the first time he saw a situation where somebody actually got the level of service that they get from us, he called it unacceptable. And he did that in the ticket in front of the team, which is like really demoralizing and really upsetting. Um, once I went back and had the conversation with him and kind of set those expectations um, and with the customer for that matter, there was a very different lens put on it. And it was like, oh, this isn't actually unacceptable at all. It's just out of the norm. Um, okay. So I think that it was just a really good illustration to me of the reason why it's so important that we bring all the customer facing teams along on our journey. We eat, sleep and breathe what we do, but not everybody does. And the bigger okay. you get um, and the more remote you get, the more intentional you have to be about that communication. I love it. And so for you, it was really just having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with that particular rep to make sure that, you know, he was clear on, on kind of the full context of the, of the issue. So yes. And um, the result of that conversation was actually that we pulled in the manager on our sales enablement team and went, how can we get this communicated in an effective way that brings value? Um, so we're now kind of doing a really cross-functional rollout of Hey, what are our service offerings and what does that look like in the new world? Yeah, that was the, my, going to be my follow-up question was, yeah. you know, given that, you know, how do you kind of then make that happen at scale versus like you said, people kind of making decisions and assumptions, you know, in a silo that then filters out through all the tentacles to the other teams with that incorrect information. Right. You know, um, Jen, have you run into this at all? Have you noticed anything like that where you yeah, are? Or what? Yeah, absolutely. I think the the very first thing that we did at Digit was that we put together uh, a coronavirus response team. So mm -hmm. members of business operations, product, uh, CS, um, and those folks got together and created what Digit's response uh, would be to our customers. Um, the top thing that came out of that was a support hub uh, providing financial health information, where to go for mortgage relief or rent relief, stimulus check information. Um, our main goal with, with that cross-functional effort was providing a level of support to our customers that they weren't getting anywhere else. It was one place they could go to get their financial questions answered. Um, so, and that took, you know, across that took people from across the whole company. Um, every, I feel like everyone had their fingers in that pie and, it, you know, we digit.co slash together. Um, you know, people can write us at that at, at together at digit. We've got the hub up. Um, you know, it was a, a very quickly spun up great cross-functional response that, you know, to really take care of our customers and keep our mission alive. Love that. How about you, Brandon? Anything? I know that you said you have a lot of a lot of your workforce has been remote. Um, have you noticed anything unique in this new environment with maybe some of the teams that weren't and how they're able to connect? Yeah, one of the most interesting things about all this that I've seen is, you know, if you take a look at our product organization of all of the people who are in product now, one of them was here a year ago. We've had like massive turnover in that mm -hmm. organization. So there are now key people starting in very essential roles who were onboarded remotely. They started after this began. So we're in this weird position of, I could have said, hey, how you doing? Introduce myself in an office. We could have gone out for coffee. So it's really an interesting challenge to try to find those new lines of communication with a person you've never had an opportunity to meet in person, which is possible to do even without new hires. But, you know, we, when that's the area of our company that we're most invested in right now, it is an interesting challenge to make sure that we just get to know each other. And that's where the virtual events come in because I've seen so many cases over the years, even in an office where silos, as Justine was saying, were very easy to form. And I think we all have to be really diligent right now about making sure those don't reform or just like new ones form as a result of COVID. Agree, and I noticed too, I mean, when you are when there's a lot of people and you're dispersed too sometimes it can be hard to potentially get everybody onto a zoom or onto calls and what one of the things i've noticed a lot that's picked up at zendesk we always joke that we have probably more slack channels than employees however one of the things that i've seen that i think is really neat is more than we used to 
people calling out really cool things that either um, that's anybody customer facing has been doing. It could be a great win um, for a customer that was struggling that we were able to help. It could be, you know, anything you can think of, but calling out those supporting members who are a part of those conversations and are, you know, on the front lines with the customer to celebrate those wins when the company is so separated, brings the company together really well, I've noticed. I've seen people coming in and joining on Slack channels and in conversations that I've never seen participate before in a sales channel because they're hungry to hear about the customer successes and what companies are doing and how they're facing this pandemic. So I think even on as simple as trying to think about, you know who would really find this interesting? A member of our product team who I know was really behind what we were doing in this new feature in the chat functionality. And this customer loved it. I want to call that out for them on the channel. So just sort of trying, encouraging my team to take that extra minute to thank the supporting teams they're working with every day to highlight those things since they might not see them right in front of them, right? They're not on those calls every day. Um, okay, next slide. So this one, we're going to turn the focus directly to the customer here. Um, I think more than ever, our customers' needs are changing. You know, Jen, you touched on this with, you know, expanding how you're supporting and then the task force that you're supporting your customers with. Things that our customers have needed from us have, are unique now compared to any time I've been at Zendesk, right? So things that I'm hearing that I've never had come up before. How, um, and an influx of it right? High volume. So maybe Brandon, you could kick off by telling us how are you guys listening to customer feedback and addressing their unique changing needs during a time like this? And is it any different than you did before? And are you seeing an influx? How are you guys approaching it? The difference for us mostly is scale. Like the specific okay. needs aren't changing, but the amount of people who have those needs are. Fandom is all about giving people the right tools that they need to consume entertainment content the best that they can. Primarily that's uh, wiki content like Wikipedia, mm -hmm. so the reference material. We also have a, a digital companion called Dungeons and Dragons Beyond, which is a tool set for D&D &D players. That's something that, you know, we're in the digital ad market primarily, and as anybody who's in that market knows, it's not a great time to be running advertisements on your site. So with D&D &D Beyond, with more of a subscription model, we're seeing an increased business need to really invest in support there because even if the specific needs aren't changing more people are playing dungeons and dragons at home so more right. people have use of those toolkits and may have you know needs ranging anywhere from i have a question about how this feature works to hey i have a payment dispute mm -hmm. I, I have a question about the bill that i got um and we're also still releasing new products on db so we just launched a few new tools for players and the benefit there is we almost have uh, a wider pool of people to give us feedback to give or to make that uh, product even better. And then on our wiki side, where I think it's the most interesting is about a year ago, we undertook a, a massive replatforming effort. The software that we use to power our wikis on fandom is about seven years out of date and was hacked together in its own unique version of doing it. We're now going back to the core media wiki software that also powers wikipedia and that means change for a lot of people and we are in a lot of ways a, a safe haven for people where they can come and find information and, and talk with other fans about star wars or game of thrones or call of duty or whatever it may be so in the middle of this unprecedented worldwide change we're also changing the website we're also changing their workflow and how they do things and that's never an easy feat on the internet to convince people of, but it's even harder now when the entire right. world is changing and now their entertainment is too. So we're trying to be really sensitive to all of that feedback. And you know, I think more so than at any time in fandom's history, really trying to meet the needs of that specific group of users, which is 3% at best of the people who use our site in addition to the fans who are coming to consume our content. I like that. I think the being uniquely positioned, you being uniquely aware of any little changes that may be, even if it is something that you know is highly anticipated and really important, recognizing that people might be, have more of a reaction to change now than they would have in the past based on, on things already going on. Yeah. Um, you know, 
how about, I think it was Justine mentioned, you know, that could have been what was going on last week with the extension of the shelter in place, but there was a lot of feelings coming through, right, on a lot of these conversations. Um, you know, piggybacking on what Brandon said, you know, Jen or Justine, have you noticed similar reactions from your customers too, right, where maybe it was more of just a straight business support question they're coming in with, but you're feeling a little more from them in those questions now than you did before? Um, oh, go ahead, yeah. Justine. Okay, thanks, Jen. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Like so much of what Brandon just said just resonated so much. Um, I think that being in the, the talent space and, and primarily working with people, onboarding new talent, hiring, um, our, our, all of our customers are uncertain right now. Everybody mm -hmm. in the world is kind of in a state of flux and they're not sure what's gonna be happening. Um, and over the last six weeks or since the beginning of March, a lot of those conversations have gone from very specifically strictly business driven decisions on their part to very emotional, um, almost reactionary in some cases, decisions that they're making. Um, we don't know if we're going to be in business next month. We don't want to hire anymore. We want to cancel our contract or we don't want to close the deal. We want to, we, because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and that's real. I mean, that's a real feeling. And I, I think that lever comes from a place and um and i personally too so it makes it easy to champion that this is a temporary thing right this this pandemic is a temporary thing and i think that the bulk of our customers and the bulk of people out there are going to come through the other end pretty positively positioned um but it's really easy for me to sit here and say that about somebody else's company and it doesn't change the way that they feel or what their fears are. Mm -hmm. um, what we actually did beginning in the early in March, we started having, getting some of these conversations, like we're not hiring, we're not going to be hiring. We, we don't, we can't afford lever anymore. We have to save every dollar we have. Um, and we pivoted, we, we rolled out an entirely new flexible payment and contracting process. It takes a conversation. Those customers mm -hmm. have to really engage with us and tell us, like, where are you at and what do you think is going to happen and, and what's your kind of, what's most important to protect right now. Um, and we just created some different plans where you can either just hold on to your account and, and pay almost nothing and you're not really hiring, you're not really doing anything. And when you start that again, then the contract goes back um, to some customers that had to have some really deep cuts and have much smaller teams and just kind of instead of renegotiating, knowing you want to bring that back, we'll just lower where your contract's at right now. Um, and just got really flexible. The reception to that has been really positive, but I think the, the thing that has really come out of it for us in my experience is that real feeling of partnership with the customer. Yeah. And really, we're really helping them, we're meeting them where they stand instead of shutting down and saying, nope, you signed a contract and that's what you're in it for. Um, and that in itself allows them to go take a deep breath mm -hmm. and know that they're not like pigeonholed into this place that they're afraid of being, um, and then make the decision again from a more strategic place on their part. So, yeah, I think there, I there's love been that. a ton of really having to listen to the customer to meet them where they stand. I love that. So true. Think the partnership, right. And come and meeting them where they are. I think that's huge. Jen, did you have anything to add? Yeah. I mean, so digit is, is a financial health uh, product. So we're here to help people save money, pay down their credit cards, pay down their student loans. So there's been a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear. And, um, but there have also, there's been a lot of gratifying moments, you know, people writing to us and saying, Hey, I'm a bartender. I lost my job, but I have $2,500 in digit saved. So thank you. You That's help, cool. you're going to help me make it through right now. Um, as far as responding to that, you know, our team was already very empowered uh, to make decisions around, you know, subscription refunds or free months and that sort of thing to work with the customers. And we've, we've really encouraged the team uh, to feel even more empowered to do so. We, you know, people are writing to us saying, hey, you know, I'm really scared right now. And I think I want to close my digit account and because I'm scared and I'm afraid I can't afford the $5 a month. And we'll say, hey, you know, we'll give you three months free. Um, you know, we want to, our, financial health is real and it's literally, you know, the business, we're doubling down on our product right now. Um, we've got, you know, we're working really hard on some, on some new stuff coming. Um, and on the support side, um, 
we're here to make that journey for that person that much more safe and simple. Uh, so the team can do whatever it takes to have that customer walk away feeling a little bit better today about their financial situation. Um, so yeah, and I really love that. Good. You touched on something that I think, and, and I think probably everybody on this line will, will appreciate it too, because I, I hear this in so many of the customer and prospect conversations I have and my team has around the power of empowering your support people mm -hmm. to do the right thing. Yep. Right. And so I think yep. that in itself, that step, you know, it, it ties all these three questions together because you're, that's motivating for an agent, how motivating for them to be on this call and hear that person who's struggling and know that they have an answer right there yep. that they can give. That's going to make it better yep. rather than feeling like they have to make that person wait and go figure it out. Right. Yep. It's motivating. It keeps the teams collaborating because they know what they can and can't do. Um, and I think it builds for better partnerships. Like mm -hmm. Justine said, right. You guys are really connecting with your customers. They're not thinking I'm just on the phone with a support rep who's going to go to the manager and they're going to go, but it's like, they're connecting with that person who's helping them directly. And I think that's so special in this kind of situation when we're all isolated to be able to make those connections, not just with your peers and your coworkers, but the people outside that you're helping. So I think that's a really, that's a really cool way to approach it. And I think it's something that I know a lot of our customers are trying to continue to do more of, right? Empowering their agents to do more. Um, this has been super enlightening for me. I hope for everybody else on the line as well. So thank you so much, Jen, Justine, Brandon. I know there are questions that aren't ones that I, that I forced you guys to read and answer that um, the, the audience has here. So I think I'm going to hand it over to our hosts and let them jump in so that you guys can get some, some questions. Uh, you know, first and foremost, a huge thank you um, for taking the time to speak with us uh, this afternoon. And I think uh, we'd like to make this as interactive as we can. So I think, um, you know, I think at this point, uh, we will unmute uh, the participants. Um, Somia, um, if you maybe wouldn't mind starting with a quick introduction and, um, you know, you had a great question. So we'll, uh, we'll give you the mic. Great. Can everybody hear me? Hi, thank you for Sounds such a great. awesome. Thank you so much for a very interesting panel session. Um, I'm Somia Kapoor. I'm a CEO of a stealth mode startup called the Loops.ai, where we're trying to do a lot more agent augmentation um, and automation piece over there. But my question was that if you had a magic wand and you were looking for tools to help with the agent productivity, especially in this remote environment, right? what would you be asking for, right? Are you looking more to optimize on customer journey at the time of ticket creation? Are you looking for an audit trail on how the resolution are happening with your internal team as that ticket is getting bounced between your agents and product teams? What are you looking for? I'll go. Um, hey, Sonia. Um, I think I want... Like what I would love is um, a way for, for, for my agents um, to be able to, you know, quickly access the information they need. So um, maybe have that as suggested to them when that ticket comes in. Right now we do a lot of macro phishing. You start typing in that search field, looking for, is that the right macro? No, nope, delete, is that the right macro? Um, so a better way to surface um, likely related, uh, solutions to, to that ticket um, on, the, on the agent side for the end user. Awesome. Uh, this, you, this is a great question and kind of teed up something that I'm very passionate about. Like I, I'm very interested in the idea of automating trust and safety as much as possible and using AI to better understand toxic behavior online. And I would love if I could wave a magic wand to have a tool that not only empowered agents, but also my community managers and our hundreds, if not thousands of volunteer moderators to know this is bad, click this button, it's not on the site anymore. And they don't have to review every comments or uh, every edit to a wiki uh, by hand, because that's incredibly time consuming, especially to our content creators. So that would be my ideal tool, because it also 
you know, if you're stuck at home and you're, you know, you're dealing with the situation like we are now, you don't want to have to deal with somebody being a jerk online. So the more that you can just automate, push a button, get rid of it, the easier I think it'll be on everybody. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I think, uh, Sami, I think it's a really good question. And you said magic wand and my mind went so many different places with that um, because I think there's so many things that would just make everybody's life better now and always in the support world. Um, but I think the one thing that would be, I don't know, this might be a shameless plug, but I think the one thing that would be really great for our reps right now is if that AI was able to go, there's an issue and get something on the status page. Um, to like before we have to go into every ticket and do the due diligence and like we know when we see somebody start submitting multiple reports of the same type of incident we know something's happening um, oftentimes by the time we know enough about it to get it up on our status page it's also already been resolved because our R&D teams move pretty quickly um, and then we we regularly get comments from customers that say well why didn't you tell us um, and it would be great if there was an AI that just like recognized a pattern of something going on and put up, like we're investigating, there's an issue um, before a human being had to like do all the work to get to that step. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think I might have a solution for all of you, but I'll reach out offline. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> well, and uh, I got to say, uh, if, uh, if we were in San Francisco, uh, you definitely would have won an amazing yellow startup t-shirt so maybe we'll work with you offline to, to see if we can make that happen um i think we have one uh time for one more question um edmund are you still online yeah i'm still here sweet uh maybe a quick intro and uh you, you were dropping a couple uh questions in the chat yeah definitely so i'm edmund from uh the bay area um from a company called Trees out of Oakland. Um, and one thing that I just wanted to see if you guys had any input on was best practices for running um, like 24 hour onshore and offshore teams um, in that sometimes uh, the, the middle of like a, an afternoon is very busy. Um, so we have to do some of our investigations a little bit later at night with a, a different shift. Um, but what are your, your suggestions on Kind of really efficiently doing that, transferring the the responsibility from daytime to the overnight shift, and ensuring that the customer actually gets a timely resolution, um, while still holding people accountable. Because I don't want to wait, you know, 24 hours till the agent's next shift to resolve an issue when the overnight, you know, overnight shift might be able to do that much sooner. I'll hop in. We use uh, a, an app on Zendesk um, where you can mark yourself as unavailable. And so what happens is uh, you mark yourself as unavailable, uh, you solve the ticket or uh, put it on pending, that customer replies, that ticket then goes to the top of the queue unassigned. Um, so that if you're on you know, weekend or PTO, um, those tickets don't go and sit and wait um, for, for you to, to show back up and check out your, your queue. So I can't remember the exact name of it, um, Someone from Digit who's on this call, if you could pop into chat and drop the name of that um, app, that would be super helpful. But that's what we use at Digit. Outstanding. So awesome I think um, just being uh, super respectful. Of I'm just going to jump in quickly. I think it's called that. Out of Office. Does that sound right? Sorry, Greg. I just wanted to make sure it didn't slip through the cracks. So I think the app was Out of Office. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you to fun. the member of your team who jumped in and said that, but I just, I saw it in the chat. So I just wanted to make sure the group got it. Thanks, Kate. Um, can we move to the next slide, Sammy? Oh, we're one slide ahead. We knocked that out. All right. Uh, on to the next. So again, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, we've got, uh, you know, we want to continue the conversation. Um, you know, so we've got another, uh, again, community can't happen without, you know, uh, uh, amazing speakers. Huge, huge, huge thanks to, you know, Kate, Brandon, and Justine. Um, they probably are going to block my phone number from here on out and or uh, <laughs> text messages. But, uh, again, heartfelt thank you. Um, you know, and then uh, we, we've got another great event, um, you know, uh, lined up with, again, um, Calm Coffee Meets Bagel and uh, Tinge. If we can go to the next slide. I'd like to hand it over to Pedro. 
Thank you, Greg. Um, so thank you everyone for being here and spending your time with us. Uh, we had a really good participation today and folks are really sending good questions. So that's really helpful for us to understand and keep creating and bringing speakers that help you to navigate this uncertain times. And to help you more with that, we have our great program for startups. So you haven't started with Zendesk yeah, and you wanna get use our technology, get access to our um, services, our customer success team in this community, you can sign up for the startup program. I shared the link here in the chat so you can have access to our suite of products for six months free. So this is a perfect opportunity for you that is like looking to Zendesk but haven't committed yet. You can just sign up to the program this landing page.